that. Um, what I want to do really is to talk about the context for St Peter's at Northampton. Uh, in a sense, uh, the building is its best witness, and there's little that one can pull in externally in terms of documentary evidence for both when St Peter's was built, why it was built in the way that it was built, and uh, who was building it, and for what purpose. Uh, so it's a bit of a puzzle. Um, and the context, I think, suggests it's a very important church altogether, if we understand it as a parish church. And it's from that perspective that I really wish to, to talk about it, uh, what makes it very unusual, um, and how it sits within what we know about the development of the parish church over the 12th century, primarily from a, an architectural perspective. Um, and uh, in terms of what we have at, uh, at St. Peter's, then uh, the main body of the church is really remarkably well preserved. Uh, this is a general view you see looking, uh, looking eastwards. The uh, east wall, the east elevation that you see here, um, is entirely the work of George Gilbert Scott um, and was put up on the original foundation line in 1851. So we know that it did have a square east end, though we have no idea as to the actual fenestration arrangement of windows that was there originally. Um, and it involved taking down a post-medieval structure at that east end in order to, uh, to do that. As you'll also see shortly, uh, then the roof is entirely modern. That is to say that until Scott uh, restored the church in the early 1850s, uh, then the nave was actually sealed and it had a low and plain ceiling over it. So it's a much more compact, compartmentalized, boxy sort of shape uh, than one has now. Um, and it sits at the, in a very particular relationship, both to the uh, pre-conquest, the late Anglo, the, 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 the Anglo-Saxon uh, town of Northampton, and also to the medieval town of, uh, of Northampton. So what you see here, these are the uh, earthwork um, uh, boundaries uh, here, the defences of, uh, of Anglo-Saxon uh, Northampton, uh, and these are the medieval walls, the line of the medieval defences that you can see here of, um, uh, of Northampton. Um, and this is a plan that was put together uh, really after a whole series of works preliminary to the redevelopment of much of this area around Mayfair uh, in the early 1980s and so late 1970s, there were a whole series of excavations here. And that sparked off a number of historical publications. Um, and this is, is, is one fruit, really, uh, of that. So you see St. Peter actually sits just here, very, very close to the site of the post-conquest castle. The post-conquest castle uh, intersects with what now is the railway station, the railway line uh, here. Um, and May, Mayfair, you can see here, uh, is a street which, which uh, just touches the north side of the churchyard of, uh, of St. Peter. Um, uh, and uh, we know of its existence as a parish church by the late 12th century. Uh, we don't really know its status prior to that. Uh, and by the late 12th century, um, then the Advowson, that is to say the ownership of the church, had been transferred to the Cluniac Abbey of St Andrew, uh, now sadly destroyed, uh, which you see up in this area here. And that Cluniac Abbey uh, is really quite a significant foundation. It was created by the first Earl of Northampton, Simon of St. Liz, or St. Lys, um, uh, and is one of a rash of uh, foundations that the Cometal family create here. Uh, the Abbey of de la Pre, which is um, uh, a nunnery, uh, is another. Uh, there's a great Augustinian house of St. James, uh, which also is extramural. It's sort of out towards the west of uh, Northampton. Uh, again, was founded by uh, Simon II of, uh, of Sonlis, the son of uh, Simon of Sonlis. Um, and there's an important uh, similar, there's an important Holy Sepulchre copy in Northampton, which those of you who live in Northampton will uh, undoubtedly know, uh, dedicated to the Holy Sepulchre, um, which is also a comital foundation, but has parochial status, which is uh, up here. Uh, in terms of where this might have sat in the Anglo-Saxon town, um, then it clearly was uh, uh, very, very close to what appears to have been a rather important um, uh, palace centre, Middle Saxon palace centre. And when this was excavated, 
uh, they discovered uh, almost like a, a sort of little nest of buildings that there was a seventh century or a, a, a timber hall, timber built hall with earth fast posts, uh, which appears to actually have these two annexes or subsidiary spaces, uh, obviously entered through openings uh, at either end of it, but which is essentially rectangular. And rather remarkably, that is then replaced by a really significant stone structure, generally interpreted as a hall, um, uh, but it's only a sort of sub-foundation and foundation level that survives for this. Um, and this also is attached to what look as if they could be service buildings uh, at this west end of the, uh, of the hall just here. Um, and there are a whole series of uh, rather famous, rather celebrated water mixers that you see here. These are very, very large bowls uh, in which you can actually mix mortar using a paddle on a gearing system. Um, so that the paddle actually sits above uh, the mortar bowl. The largest of them is about two meters in diameter. So it's a very big thing. You can actually mix a lot of mortar in, uh, in one of these. Uh, and they appear to be contemporary with the eighth, ninth century structures. Uh, and there is the east wall of what has been interpreted as the Middle Saxon Minster, uh, which you see to the west of it here, and which extends as part of a building beneath the existing church of, uh, of St. Peter's over here. So it's quite possible that what we have at St. Peter's is a successor to an important palace minster as part of a large palace site uh, here, um, uh, which uh, obviously is taken down uh, at a relatively early stage following the conquest uh, here. So there may be some sort of intermediate period before St. Peter's itself is actually built on this site uh, here. Um, the other bit of information which is probably helpful from an archeological point of view is that there is another church uh, with the dedication to St. Gregory, uh, which is to the southeast of the, uh, of the palace uh, just here. So there may be a pair of churches. Uh, the actual church itself wasn't excavated or discovered as such, but its graveyard was. Um, and you can see the cemetery down here with again, um, uh, burials which uh, seem to be early to mid Saxon. Uh, here. So we're probably looking at a very important Mercian royal palace uh, complex uh, here with, uh, with minster status, the memory of which survives the conquest uh, as such. But uh, beyond that, it's really difficult to, uh, to say. Um, as far as the actual church itself is concerned of St Peter's, then for reasons I'll go into shortly, this best fits the second quarter of the 12th century. Um, it seems generally to be dated to 1130, 1140 in most of the literature, not there's a, <laughs> a significant or substantial literature really, which touches on St. Peter's. That strikes me as being slightly early. Um, you know, I, I, I'd be more inclined to go for the decade after that, uh, 1140, 50, uh, perhaps. But nonetheless, it sits in that sort of period in the second quarter of the, uh, of the, uh, of the 12th century. Um, uh, and as you look at it from the exterior, uh, first thing which immediately strikes you is that it has a clear story. Uh, and you can see the clear story here uh, with a series of, uh, of blind, arcade, uh, blind arcades uh, and then with, with windows which are, are, are actually very slightly irregularly uh, positioned uh, uh, here, but um, uh, uh, not significantly irregular in the sense that the, the pattern is one that you, uh, you can make out really relatively easily. Um, it also has a West Tower. Uh, this West Tower uh, has been reconstructed. Uh, it was reported to be dilapidated in 1607, um, and it was reconstructed at some indeterminate date, probably post-Civil War, but in the, uh, in the 17th uh, century. And when it was reconstructed, it was reconstructed slightly west in all likelihood of where it had been previously because it cuts into what was the western bay of the nave in a way that you'll see shortly in the interior. Um, that suggests that the dilapidation is probably uh, related to dilapidation in the westernmost bay of the nave as well, otherwise I don't think they'd have bothered moving to such. So presumably the east face of that tower or whatever it was supporting, spire perhaps, actually collapsed and it damaged, very badly damaged, 
uh, the West Bay of the Nave as well and took that with it. Um, and subsequently, um, you know, a sort of heap of ruins was then pieced back together. Some parts of it clearly survived more or less intact, of which what is now the entry into the nave is the most celebrated case. Um, and it seems very likely that this also actually had a Western entrance. They've certainly reused elements of a very unusual design here in the uh, west facing bay of the uh, of the tower. It's been much interfered with, you know, both in the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries here. Um, but it's very likely it's also been been set wrongly. It's been set far too high um, and it's been flattened. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, there is evidence that there would have been a sort of through entrance uh, within the actual tower itself. Um, and the nave looks like this. Uh, it's aisled, has a two story elevation um, and a very interesting arrangement in terms of the clear story windows or rather relationship between the clear story windows and the arcade which you see beneath it. Um, and it works according to a sort of sequence of twos and threes. So the chancel is organized with three arcade bays and indeed three clear story windows. Um, and the nave consists of three double bays. Uh, you can see two and a bit of them uh, here. Uh, these are paired um, and the clear story window actually intersects in a very interesting way uh, with those bays here. So it's on an entirely autonomous rhythm vis-a-vis -vis the interior arcade, but it's relatively consistent when viewed from the exterior uh, as, you've, uh, as you've already seen. Um, it also makes use of something which is quite exceptional in uh, a, a, a 12th century parish church, vertical articulation. That is to say that these half columns here run up uh, the wall uh, right up to the actual parapet uh, here and may have made a connection uh, with the roofing structure uh, in its original frame. Um, George Gilbert Scott certainly made use of them in that way. So you can see the way in which his trusses here actually rest or, 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 uh, or you know, exploit the visual emphasis that these capitals, uh, in fact, uh, give it. This is the uh, tower arch uh, as it was reconstructed uh, on what would have been the junction between the fifth and the sixth bay of the nave. You can see how it is they actually cut into the clear story window just here, which would have been centered interestingly actually in this western pair of, uh, of bays and it's a very remarkable thing to see as a tower arch if it resembles anything at all it resembles a chancel arch that's been sort of exiled westwards uh, and uh, it's uh, it's a thing of great beauty. Uh, the, the actual uh, capital style in the uh, in the church is a subject of a, uh, of a Henry Maguire MA thesis, actually a court old thesis that was done for George Zanetsky back in the um, in the sort of in the 1960s. Um, and uh, Maguire sort of isolated uh, certain traits uh, within the sculpture. Uh, thought there were probably four different sculptors working here. There are probably more than that, uh, in fact. Um, and they are unusual. Uh, they're very, very richly worked. Uh, and they certainly fall into sort of stylistic camps, which you tend to find in concentrations within the church itself. That is to say that the sculptural allotment seems to be given out within that workshop, um, according to roughly speaking, where the capitals are going to be positioned within the church. And unsurprisingly, it's the east end of the nave and the chancel in which you find the, 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 the busiest capitals, the richest concentration of highly detailed work. Uh, this is one example that you see uh, here. I should also say that you get crossovers as far as the abaci are actually concerned. So I think they're actually dividing up the work here within that workshop. The sculptor responsible for capital isn't necessarily the same sculptor who is really responsible for these abaci. The abaci are really sort of quite distinctive. Um, so you get this type of, uh, of work. Uh, with these uh, leafless tendrils, these wiry types of tendrils, uh, and with creatures that are caught up within it. So birds pecking at seed pods, uh, as you see uh, just here. 
Uh, there's also a very different type of foliage, this very sort of thickly worked, knotty type of, uh, of foliage that you tend to find around the center of the, uh, of the nave uh, here, with what the, the French had called les toiles en creux uh, up here, um, these beveled uh, saltire crosses, uh, as you can see for the abacus uh, just there. Um, there are a number of capitals of these remarkably prominent volumes. Um, this is a, a nice example of one of those in which you see the foliage repertoire is now leapt up onto the abacus, as you see it uh, just here. Um, and we get this type of architectonic detailing as well. So uh, little spiral columns of capitals uh, actually on the capital, uh, as it were, breaking up the surface of the, uh, of the capital. Very, very strong diagonals uh, as well. Um, more of this sort of tendril type uh, foliage, as you see, uh, just here, almost wrapped around and continuing around. So, so essentially a single design for a capital around one of these quadrilobe piers here, these four part piers. Um, uh, and then down towards the West End, on the whole, slightly plainer uh, capitals, um, uh, though uh, more unusually in the context of Anglo-Norman sculpture, um, also with uh, decorated astrogels or neckings. Uh, here. Ordinarily a necking is just uh, a plain moulding, but uh, even these are actually being, uh, being decorated uh, here. And finally, uh, a very disciplined, ge geometrically disciplined uh, capital, uh, which you see here again with uh, these little biting heads they seem to be rather fond of. Um, this sculptural workshop you can see elsewhere is very much a sort of South Midlands workshop. Um, uh, with one rather curious outlier, um, which is to say that all the other uh, buildings with which we can actually associate it are either in Northamptonshire or uh, sort of North Buckinghamshire. Um, you know, so it's sort of clustered in this area uh, here. The one outlier uh, is probably a rogue, which is uh, the great collegiate church, actually St Chad at Stafford, uh, all of whose capitals are actually replaced by George Gilbert Scott uh, and are probably, in fact, modelled on the capitals here at Northampton. A couple of them are, are real ringers, uh, and they're very badly recorded, the decayed capitals, uh, which they replaced at, uh, at Stafford, are really very, very badly uh, recorded. So one should probably discount that um, uh, and, and really sort of see this simply as a, as a local workshop. Um, it specialised particularly in creating fonts, um, and there are a group of them, actually, in, uh, in Northamptonshire, uh, most of them within about 20 miles of, uh, of Northampton. Uh, this is Whedon Lois. Uh, you can see this type of palmette design, uh, again, uh, being used here. Um, uh, and uh, lots and lots of these beaded, um, sort of beaded filling that you have for the um, uh, arcade work. Uh, another variation uh, on that same theme, uh, which you see, uh, just here, uh, uh, or uh, this is probably the grandest of them, which is much more akin, in fact, to the chancel capitals uh, here. So these, you might regard this as sort of real bread and butter stuff uh, you see here at Weedon Lois and Tiffield, um, you know, whereas this sort of thing uh, you see here, uh, it probably involved two or even three members of that uh, of that that Northampton uh, workshop, but their neck plus ultra. I mean, their great commission is clearly St Peter's at Northampton. Where else they might have uh, worked is it now impossible to say. Um, there's almost nothing that's come out of excavations at, at St Andrews at the Cluniac uh, House, but one would expect a workshop like this of this sort of um, ability. Uh, to actually probably have been employed in, on great church uh, commissions. It may even be that they're an offshoot from a great church workshop. That seems to be not untypical, in fact, of parish church workshops, insofar as we know very much about them in the second quarter of the, uh, of the 12th century. But you can point to, you know, there's a workshop in Norfolk, for example, uh, that's responsible for all the geometric sculpture at Castle Acre Priory, it's a great Cluniac Priory there, uh, but also works at about 12 or 13 parish churches across Norfolk. 
Um, and I sort of, I also, I'm the Herefordshire School, I think is another example of this sort of thing. I think it's responsible. It forms um, in a more or less at Hereford Cathedral, and then it goes on, it works a number of, uh, of parish churches. That in, in a sense would make a lot of sense from a practical point of view as well, in terms of the training of a workshop such as this, it, 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 it would actually find its feet um, uh, here in a, in a sort of great church programme. Uh, as such, and then uh, probably uh, not so much branch out, uh, but quite simply find work and it, find patrons. Patrons will find it as a result, uh, really, of, uh, of that. Um, what's most remarkable, however, uh, at that sort of date, that is to say everything about it sort of fits in the second quarter of the 12th century, is the actual plan of the church. Um, uh, and uh, the church is it's fully ironed, um, uh, but it's also uh, what in the jargon is called a through-built church. Um, what's meant by that is there's no structural division uh, between the nave and the chancel. Uh, there probably was a screen of some sort. I mean, you can create all sorts of visual distinctions um, between the two areas, um, and they clearly do uh, create a, a rhythmic distinction uh, so the chancel consists of three bays organised as a triplet, whereas the nave is a whole series of paired bays as such. Uh, but nonetheless, there's no prominent division. There's no transept here. There's no intermediate tower. Above all, there's no arch, uh, which actually separates the, uh, the nave from the, uh, from the chancel. Chancel arches in parish churches are almost de rigueur in the, uh, in the 12th century, uh, as you'll see. Uh, shortly. So that's a very, very unusual thing altogether. Um, uh, and in terms of the actual stepping of the levels, um, then I, I was slightly mistaken about this uh, when I, I sort of wrote a little bit uh, or included St Peter's at Northampton in uh, something I wrote about the 12th century parish church, um, because I knew that Scott took down, he actually lured the level of the nave pavement um, uh, here and I assume that in so doing he actually created the two steps uh, that, that separate the chancel area here from the nave but in fact he didn't uh, he simply lowered them and replaced those those two steps the reason why he did this is so he could put an additional three steps up to the actual altar at the east end of the uh, of the church but at that fact this stepping arrangement here these two steps is really revealed in John Lecour's uh, engraving uh, here of the interior, uh, looking west, uh, has done well before Scott uh, actually got his hands on the on the church. Um, uh, so, uh, where does that actually uh, sort of fit? Well, um, in in overall terms, uh, we can't parallel this in English parish church architecture, uh, and it seems to have a foot in a great church camp. Um, and one aspect of that is an aesthetic aspect. Um, and that is to do with the relationship between an arcade and a clear story and the arrangement of the uh, arcades into threes and twos, into systems of bays. And it's not something, it's not an aesthetic that had been explored hitherto in English parish churches because you simply don't have aisles in English parish churches previously. So it doesn't come, it's not a question that can be posed in this parish church sort of environment. Um, we're starting to get elaborate peer design in parish churches at a broadly similar date and actually using alternating systems. So uh, this here is a type of alternating system in which you have a quattrilo pier and then uh, a columnar pier with these big shaft rings or these big annular rings uh, here and then a columnar pier or uh, uh, this type of, uh, of arrangement. This is what we actually get here. Um, this is St Margaret Cliff in, uh, in Kent, which is another absolutely top notch uh, mid 12th century parish church uh, as well. But what we don't have uh, here is the extension of the pier system actually into the upper elevation or vertical articulation. There's no connection uh, really between the, uh, between the arcade and the clear story below it. To find that sort of thing, um, you really have to look elsewhere. And the same is true of the actual pier design 
here. Whoever designed this church is familiar with uh, a rather recondite world, which is the, the world of Anglo-Norman peer design, uh, elaborate peer design and alternating rhythmic systems. Um, so that as far as the actual um, uh, uh, minor peers here are concerned, so these columns with their shaft ring, um, then this is the sort of place that you actually tend to find this type of thing. This is the Westport at Rochester Cathedral, where again, you can see here these columns with these types of shaft rings, uh, very, very highly decorated shaft rings, almost early Gothic really in, uh, in feel as such. And in terms of vertical articulation, um, and you really have to go to great churches in order actually to, uh, to find it. This is Ely, uh, where of course it's a three-story elevation uh, with a great gallery as such. Um, and we have this consistent use of half columns uh, on uh, pilaster backs, on dosserets here that run from pavement up to parapet. Perhaps a closer parallel, in fact, would be the earlier work at, uh, at Ely in the transepts, particularly the north transept, um, where we actually have vertical articulation, not in every bay, uh, but working according to an alternating system. So uh, here you actually have a, a half column that runs from uh, the bottom to the top of the elevation, uh, but you don't have in this bay just here. That in a way is closer to what we have at St. Peter's at Northampton, but it's not a close parallel generally anyway, um, because these are being used on a huge scale in buildings with thick walls, with wall passages, with a lot else actually going on within the elevation, but it's ultimately this sort of idea that sits behind what you see at St. Peter's at, uh, at Northampton. Somebody is transforming, is taking this type of vocabulary and adapting it, uh, and adapting it really very, very cleverly indeed. Um, uh, one other thing one should bear in mind in terms of the exterior silhouette is what we've now lost at uh, St. Peter's at Northampton. Uh, so we don't have any original aisle windows uh, here. Um, instead, it's actually been refenestrated and the aisle has been heightened. You can see a sort of tide mark in terms of the uh, uh, masonry at this level here, just above the tops of the uh, largely Victorianized late medieval windows you see uh, just here. So uh, that heightening uh, actually has quite an impact uh, on the way in which you see the interior of the building is entirely consistent with what we know of uh, aisles in parish churches really right through the, uh, right through the 12th century uh, as such. Uh, they're narrow and they're nearly always low. Um, and the difference between uh, the roof now, as you can see, uh, is that the uh, actual projection of that roof, uh, the ramp, is really very slight in comparison with what it would have been to illustrate that point because the overwhelming majority of 12th century aisles in parish churches were heightened in the later middle ages i can show you the sort of effect you have so this is compton in surrey you see here and the south aisle at compton's been raised so that's the top of a uh, a Romanesque window, the original window, it's been raised in order to put bigger windows into the aisle. Uh, so the aisle's been built up and this lean-to roof, as you can see with its wall plate, actually sits at a much higher level than the uh, north aisle, here the left-hand aisle, which is actually at the original height of that, of that aisle. So that's the sort of classic difference really in terms of height um, between these aisles. Um, another great, I mean, classic illustration really, is what happens at some kind of over at Castor in the Soak of Peterborough. This is just uh, west of Peterborough. Uh, really very important former Minster Church uh, on, a, on, a, on a Roman site um, uh, here above the, above the River Neen, uh, in fact. Um, and originally this is a first built as an Isle's cruciform church. When they add aisles, which is the same time as this arch here and that arch there, um, then that is the slope of the aisle roof, uh, as you see uh, just here. Um, uh, uh, and subsequently, uh, in the early 14th century, in order to put in large windows and bring a lot more light into the church, they build up the height of the aisle in order to fit these windows uh, in it. And there are any number of examples you can see of that. Uh, in terms of how it would look 
at St. Peter's at Northampton. Um, then um, Romanesque windows in aisle churches are small. Uh, at least their outer apertures are small. Um, they usually have very, very deep single splays uh, inside. So this is Thorn and Parva in Suffolk, where you can see the sort of impact, the effect of that, where you've got a, a 14th century window, a 15th century window, and here, one of the original uh, windows in the interior, uh, the effect is, uh, is like this. So it's, it's Northampton, much more like this, uh, in terms of the original fenestration in that, uh, in that aisle as you have it. So that's what you need to put in your mind's eye, a sort of top of the aisle, probably about here, uh, uh, such and a few small windows uh, in that uh, in that aisle wall. Where else does it sit? Well, um, essentially, Romanesque parish churches uh, really tend to sort of fall into very distinct categories. The majority of them are cellular and aisleless, um, and this is just an example of that. Uh, they're sort of longitudinally sequenced. So you get a chancel, as you see here, and a nave. Occasionally you actually get three cells in these, uh, in these church arrangements. Now the chancel is always narrower than the nave, and it's usually longer. Um, this is a sort of three cell design, very famous three cell design that you see here at Kilpoke, where you can see the stepping down of the actual roof lines, but also the narrowing of each of those spaces. Uh, this is another example, really, of the same sort of arrangement with a later medieval tower added to it. This is uh, Kempley, just over the border from Herefordshire into, uh, into Gloucester, uh, Gloucestershire. Um, and again, the two are separated by a wall which is perforated with a chancel arch. Um, in, the, in, in the area where I live, um, you know, it's in Oxfordshire, uh, Oxfordshire, Buckinghamshire, you get quite a lot of three cell parish churches in which the tower isn't at the west, it's at the centre uh, of it. So this is uh, St. Merritt Ifley, as you see uh, here, this is um, uh, St. Michael at Stukeley uh, in, in uh, Buckinghamshire. Again, it's the same sequencing of uh, a space, it's highly articulated and it involves archers, archers that actually uh, define the spaces uh, within the church itself. Um, uh, uh, the other, the alternative, and certainly churches to which much, much higher status seems to attach uh, in the post-conquest period, are aisleless cruciform churches. These are churches with projecting transepts, which almost by definition will have a tower at the center, insofar as you, as you have a four arched crossing, which is in sort of 99% of cases, um, then you'll actually have a, a, a tower, in fact, over the crossing. They often acquire aisles in the later Middle Ages, well, really from the, from the uh, second half of the 12th century, onwards, but um, uh, they're almost, the, 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 the vast majority of these either are former minster churches, that is to say superior churches that would have been served before the conquest by a group of clergy, and that though the, the, the clergy of the minster church would then provide pastoral care at chapels within what is known as the parochia, which is a, a very large territorial area. And they might have anything up to 10 or 12 chapels that will be served from a, a central minster. Um, and after the conquest, these are often reconstructed as aisleless cruciform churches. And some of the former field chapels might also gain parochial status uh, as such. Um, uh, so either uh, these types of churches, former minster churches, tend to be reconstructed in this way, or churches built by bishops on their own manners. Uh, East Mian actually is an example of both. It's a former minster church also held uh, next to a palace of the bishops of, uh, of Winchester, uh, as you see uh, just, uh, just here. This is uh, New Shoreham, uh, sorry, Old Shoreham rather, uh, in, in Sussex, big sort of Dubrow's uh, financed uh, parish church again, which is still, in fact, an Isle's cruciform uh, parish church. Um, this is uh, St. John at Devizes, 
which uh, again has been sort of aggrandized. It's been uh, variously extended and expanded with uh, with aisles, but it's a uh, it's a new church created by a bishop uh, that is Roger of Sarum. Uh, in a new town, which is uh, Devizes uh, here, it's the principal parish church for uh, for that, with a rather unusual rectangular uh, crossing tower uh, here. But again, uh, the same uh, sort of thing. This is St. Kyderberger at Castor uh, once more. Um, and they nearly always leave ghosts or residues. You can usually tell uh, that a church like this starts out as an Isleless cruciform church, and then it acquires aisles, and it's variously sort of uh, developed uh, as such. Isles themselves, well, um, uh, they, they uh, when do they start to appear in parish churches? This is a, a sort of hot question uh, in the tiny world of, um, of, of, of English medieval parish church studies um, at the moment. Uh, there are a sort of little cluster of these in Hertfordshire, which seem to be 11th century, probably pre-conquest. But we're often unsure about what the status of the church really is. Uh, so this is All Saints at Wing. Um, this sort of dates to probably about the year 1000, shortly thereafter. The actual clear store is then replaced. You can see the church has been heightened as well. Um, you know, but and rather splendid uh, arcade here. The aisles are then widened as such, but we still actually have the arcade, which went with narrow aisles originally. But whether this is a parish church uh, when it was built round about the year 1000 uh, or really something else, uh, sort of minister church, it was a former monastery, um, you know, sort of pre-Danish, pre-Danish invasion. So, so there's, a, there's a significant question really over, uh, over that. In terms of actual parish churches that we are pretty sure are created as parish churches, uh, then the earliest is Ickleton. Um, that survives this is just south of Cambridge uh, here. This is uh, probably dates about 1080. It's a very high status manor uh, is, uh, is Ickleton. It's awarded to the uh, uses of Boulogne, um, you know, after the Battle of, uh, Battle of Hastings. Uh, and it sort of sits within the Boulogne family. Eventually it, it sort of passes on to sort of King Stephen. Uh, in fact, it's a royal manor. Um, uh, after, after the, the House of Bologna lose control uh, of it. Um, uh, but as with St Peter's at Northampton, the actual holding of the church, um, you know, may offer some insight into the prestige that attaches to it and the resources that are available for it, but they don't explain why this sort of architecture was chosen for a parish church. Um, as such, they permit it, but they don't really they enable it, they don't explain it uh, as such. So um, that then is, uh, is Ickleton, as you see here, in the classic narrow um, Romanesque aisle. Um, by the 1140s, however, by the sort of date that St. Peter's is going up, then we can see former Minster churches being built with integral aisles. So this is Hemel Hempstead, uh, you see here, it's a view from the southeast, this is the nave looking uh, eastwards at uh, Hemel Hempstead, so it has an aisleless transept, aisleless chancel, big aisled nave, uh, such, um, and the sort of classic, I mean another classic demonstration of the development of uh, of aisles really came out of Warwick Rodwell's excavations at Barton on Humber, uh, and the excavations at Barton, I mean Bot the St Peter's at Barton on Humber, uh, it's the most thoroughly understood church from an archaeological perspective uh, as a parish church, really, in um, it really in Europe. Um, I mean, these were exemplary excavations and they've been superbly published um, as well. Um, and what you see here are the various phases and the aisles are added piecemeal. Um, the first of them is a classic uh, narrow south aisle on the town side of the church with a porch. Uh, as you see just here. Um, uh, and this can be dated to about 1200. Um, you then get a narrow north aisle here. You then get the widening, the narrow north aisle about sort of 1230, and a widening of this uh, around about 1300. On the north side, about 1340, is a rather nice sort of deck, um, a curvilinear build uh, is this. And then finally, uh, 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 a sort of um, a reconstruction of the upper 
elevation of the uh, of the church in the uh, in the 15th century, uh, as you see there. Uh, had this not been excavated, we would have had no idea about the narrow wild phase at, uh, at Barton and Humber. Uh, here. We might have just had a sort of intimation something unusual was going on because one of the arcades is much earlier than, uh, than the aisle to which it's, it's attached. And English parish churches are full of buildings rather like this, uh, with early arcades with much later medieval wide aisles, uh, quite simply because the aisles have been replaced as such. So to come back to St Peter's uh, here, um, uh, it is exceptional in terms of the level of detailing in the church, um, and it is unparalleled in terms of it being through built, but it is parallel as an aisle church. Aisles are emerging at this sort of period, and not only aisles, uh, because arcades are compulsory, you, know, you, can't, you can't have an aisle without, an arcade, without a way of getting into it from the nave, so you are going to have an arcade, but uh, not only arcades, but also clear stories are uh, beginning to uh, to appear in in uh, English medieval parish churches by this sort of date. But the through build is something that we can't really parallel before the second half of the of the twelfth century. Uh, and the earliest example after St Peter's at Barton on Humber that I've been able to um, you know to 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 uh, to um, encounter is Tilney All Saints uh, in the Fens. This is sort of just southwest of King's Lynn. It's just in, it's on the sort of Norfolk, Cambridgeshire, Lincolnshire borders. Um, like St. Peter's, it's a nine bay church. Um, it is really quite exceptional. Uh, it has uh, a certain variety in its peer design. Um, but it's almost quixotic uh, in terms of, 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 of how that is uh, organised, a little clustered pier you can see here, um, that otherwise are basically columnar piers, um, and a significant uh, distance really uh, between the, uh, the line and level of the original clear through windows, um, which we can reconstruct on the later medieval fenestration, uh, as you'll see here, um, uh, uh, and it's through built. Uh, exactly as St Peter's is. There's no structural division uh, between the uh, the chancel and the nave, though obviously uh, there is a screen, there's a late medieval screen that, uh, that makes that distinction uh, here. Um, you can also see this string course here and these arches, these actually outline the original windows here. They had sills that came down to this level here. They're not flat sills, sloping sills as such. So the actual glazing, the bottom of the glazing is about this level here, and the bottom of the splay is just above that string course you can see there. Um, and also it's quite clear at Tilney All Saints, this dates I think about 1180, uh, it's quite clear that in fact there were low windows, there's a low square end of projection as is the case at St. Peter's at Northampton, beyond the ends of the aisles. So the aisles ended originally are just here. Um, and then you have this chancel projection here, which actually had windows on two levels. So windows here, and then windows up here as such. Uh, and you can see the top, the head, and the blocking of one of these original windows here, and all these late medieval windows that you see here actually sit exactly where the previous windows actually sat. They just take out the tops and expand the window space itself. Uh, what that means effectively is that originally before this vestry is built here, um, that actually this area, these two bays here are flooded with light. There's more light here than in any other space in the church. That will have been the case at St. Peter's at Northampton. Even if we can't reconstruct the precise fenestration, you will have had a concentration of light in that area itself. And what is striking about that is this is really what you get in late medieval churches. Um, so this is, is, is Blythborough, for example, at the other end of East Anglia, in, on the sort of Norfolk, Suffolk borders uh, almost, but in Suffolk uh, here, but, but uh, the East Suffolk. Uh, such where you get this uh, square ended extension um, that really sort of puts a lot of light with a big east window as well uh, into this area uh, just here. Um, what else? Well, uh, in fact, that type of design that we have, the through building remains rare. Though the Isle Parish Church 
um, particularly with elaborate peer designs, comes into its own uh, over the sort of second half of the uh, of the 12th century, probably gathering pace from about 1160, 70 onwards. Uh, is particularly prevalent in the Fens, um, where the sort of greatest number of examples of this type of design in which the nave is favoured and being developed. Uh, but they usually come with chancel arches. Uh, the most informative in terms of the origins of this building type is Walsokum, um, now a suburb, more or less a suburb actually, Wisbeach. Um, uh, uh, here. And this is a view of, uh, uh, of Walsokan looking uh, eastwards. Um, what you can see here is there's an alternating system for the actual piers. So they are octagonal round, octagonal round. They also alternate as it happens across the space. So these octagons on the north side actually have a face on the north, south, east, west axes, on the cardinal axes. Whereas these octagons here have been twisted through half a revolution um, so that you have a, 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 an angle actually on the cardinal axis. You can see a little point here. Um, and that gives us a sort of clue as to where this, this, this sort of architecture is really coming from. The chancel arch is, of course, immensely elaborate, as you'd expect at this sort of period uh, here, that really draws attention to the splendor of that um, uh, opening. Um, and the chancel itself, more unusually, is also aisled and fully fenestrated. And you can see the blocked openings uh, here. Uh, once more, it has, as at Tilney All Saints, this little extension uh, outwards uh, with more windows to create more light at the very east end of the, uh, of the church. Uh, what it relates to very clearly as a monastic infirmary at Ely Cathedral. And one suspects that this is probably a building type which is being adapted by by uh, parish churches, that in fact monastic buildings, particularly infirmaries, possibly refectories, but infirmaries of this sort of building are here. Two-story elevations, lightweight, wooden roofed, elaborate pier design as such. Um, uh, and one can sort of see it not only in terms of the actual arrangement of the, of the piers and the alternating system at uh, Walsoken, uh, but Walsoken also quotes the entrance into the chapel at the east end of the infirmary at Ely. So this is what survives of that there at Ely. And you can see these little shaft rings here at consistent um, uh, uh, intervals on the uh, innermost chancel uh, support. Uh, and this is really what we get here at, uh, at Walsoken. It's a straightforward lift from Ely. It's a sort of homage really to that type of, uh, of design. And this is uh, what it actually uh, looks like. The one difference, um, and it's one that's probably worth stressing, is that when you look at most of these Finland parish churches uh, from the exterior, you have no idea that they are still late 12th century interiors. Uh, and that's the real difference between that type of, um, uh, of church, late 12th century church, and um, uh, the late medieval uh, church. That is to say that the status that's accorded to the aisles, their width and height and large windows really make the difference. So they're nearly all refenestrated uh, at clear story level, as you see here at Walsoken. The aisles are widened and much bigger windows actually go in. And that doesn't happen at that sort of level at Northampton. And that says something about the nature of the parish in the later Middle Ages at Northampton. Uh, this actually is a very, very important parish. Uh, it sits close to the, uh, to the castle itself. We know that the Advousen is held by uh, the Cluniac uh, uh, Priory at Northampton, that that was founded by the Earls of Northampton. The Earls of Northampton hold the castle and the castle itself is actually within the parish of St. Peter, so that the castle garrison, and the constable and so on, these are all uh, ultimately parishioners uh, uh, here. They owe their tithes um, uh, uh, to the parish at St. Peter's. So it's a very, very high status parish in that sense. Uh, and it seems to go into um, uh, uh, almost sort of fossilization in the later Middle Ages. 
Um, that is to say that you get lots and lots of windows here, but there's very, very little development of the church itself, unlike the big parish churches um, uh, that, that, that pioneer these sorts of naves in the Fens, uh, for example. Uh, uh, and, and in one sense, for a sort of Romanesque like myself, uh, this is a rather wonderful thing. It preserves the church in something like the sort of state that um, uh, I would like to see it. Um, but it is a, a comment uh, on the on the actual sort of um, uh, ups and downs of uh, parochial status uh, here in uh, in Northampton. I think that's pro I think I'll probably I think I will wind up there. I have no more to say. Thank you very much.